Welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. After last week's revelation that Jumbo Visma and Sudan Quickstep could be merging, this week we had this bombshell. I can just definitely confirm, yes, that uh, I will leave the team, but uh, we want to tell all the details uh, to wear uh, after uh, after the races that I do. So yes, first I'm here to, to race, uh, so be focused here and uh, then we do next moves. That's right, Primoz Roglic is on the move and he probably isn't the only one. The drama in pro cycling continues to happen off the bike more than on, but I'll also be wrapping up all of last week's racing for you as well. This week in the world of racing, we learned that Arno De Lee is so strong, he can win a race with one leg. Well, there is on the left-hand side, it is Arno De Lee. De Lee in the centre. On the right-hand side, it's Groves. Groves, De Lee. De Lee, Groves, it is. De Lee takes his foot out. He puts it back in again. Oh, what happened? It looks like it's going to be Dor on the line. Unbelievable. One-legged De Lee takes victory. De Lee did confirm afterwards that he'd broken his cleat, but that won't have been much consolation to all the riders that he beat. We also learnt that the skill of bunny hopping can come in useful even in road racing. That was Viktor Potok, current Croatian cyclocross national champion, avoiding disaster by hopping over race leader Orlois Ola, who thankfully was able to get up and walk across the line to claim the overall title at the Crow race. We also learned that it was raining cats and dogs at the Tour of Istanbul yesterday. Just a rogue dog. Uh, just hope it doesn't turn right. Just keep to the left. And finally, we learned that Primoz Roglic's eight-year tenure at Jumbo Visma will come to an end at the end of this season. Uh, there had been rumblings for the last few weeks that there might be some discontent there, and on Saturday, ahead of the Giro della Miglia, he confirmed to reporter Antoine Plouvin that he is heading to pastures new. Now, in some ways, it was surprising to hear the news, but in other ways, you can understand it. Over the eight years that he's been with the team, Roglic has won 74 races, including three welters, a Giro d'Italia, and a further 10 World Tour stage races. He was their king, and the man at the helm of transforming that team into the one that we know today. However, there is one race that he hasn't won in those eight years, the Tour de France, and that is where the complications lie. His understudy, Jonas Vinegar, has now won it twice, and so however much Roglic has done for the team over the years, Vinegar is going to be their main man at that main race for the foreseeable future. Could co-leadership have worked? Possibly. It certainly helped Vinegar to the first of his two tours, but that's clearly not what Roglic wants. He feels he's earned the right to be sole leader at the Tour de France, and few would argue against him deserving that. So whilst his departure is confirmed, his destination isn't. Uh, Dan Benson has been doing a lot of digging on this one. You can find his articles on the matter over at globalcyclingnetwork.com. Uh, Mobistar was strongly rumoured to begin with, but they've denied offering a contract to Roglic, as have Jaco Alula, Bahrain Victorias and Lidl Trek. So that leaves three teams in the mix theoretically. Bora Hansger, Ineos Grenadiers and Israel Premier Tech. Three teams that have the budget to afford what is likely to be around €6 million Euros a year in salary. Now, the latest reports have suggested it's between Bora and Ineos, but then there's a chance that another very high-profile rider might also soon be on the market. That man is Remco Avenepoel. Now, there have been rumours circulating for over a year that Ineos were interested in signing him, uh, the problem being that Avonpool is locked into a long-term contract with Soudal Quickstep. However, if this merger does happen, and Patrick Lefebvre confirmed last week that a letter of intent has been signed, only one of the team's World Tour licences will remain. In all likelihood, that would be the Jumbo Visma licence, which would mean that any rider currently signed to Soudal Quickstep would be free to move on if they wish, even if they have a long-term contract. It all gets very complicated, doesn't it? Anyway, according to L'Equipe in France, one rider agent says it's widely known that Remco Avenepoel would never ride for Richard Plugger's team, that of Jumbo Visma, and that in the event of the two teams merging, Avenepoel's contract at Ineos would be done and dusted in just five minutes. Now, another bit of news that came out in what's been a crazy week in pro cycling was that Amazon may be stepping in to sponsor Jumbo Visma. Vida Feats reported that Amazon may be investing 15 million euros a year into the combined super team and that they'd also done a deal with Specialized rather than Cervelo. But Lefebvre, in his Het Newsblad column, said that the arrival of Amazon could put a stick in the spokes of a deal between the two teams. 
Now you've got a feel for all the riders wrapped up in this whole saga, and I don't just mean those that are currently riding for Jumbo or for Quickstep. There are many reports of other teams stalling contract renewals with current riders as they wait to see the outcome of this whole thing. Potentially, I guess, keeping money aside to sign riders who unexpectedly come on the market. So this merger would have rumblings that ripple through the whole of the men's side of the sport, not just within those two teams. If I'm honest, the riders that I'm least worried about are those that are currently in those two teams. They're so high profile that other squads are going to swoop down like vultures to get whatever scraps they can get. I guess scraps probably not quite the right word in this context, but you know what I mean. However, riders who've had a bad season in another team and who are hoping to get a renewal might find that they are the ones who pay the price for this merger if it happens. That's kind of what happened in 2011 when HTC folded. Whatever way you look at it though, somebody is always going to get hurt if two major teams become one. What would be good for the sport though, is if Primoz Roglic, Jonas Vinegar, Remco Evenepoel and Tadej Pogacar are all on different teams next year. Seeing all four of them line up fit and ready for the Tour de France in 2024 would be a mouth-watering prospect and one that looks significantly more likely than it did just one week ago. Now, with the speed at which things are going, I strongly suspect that everything I've just said will be old news by the time this video is edited and released, but keep your eyes peeled to our website, globalcyclingnetwork.com, where we'll bring you all the latest as soon as we get wind of it. Okay, shall I get on to some actual racing? That means getting back to Primoz Roglic, who clearly hasn't let the drama off the bike affect him on it. At the Giro della Miglia on Saturday, he came up against Tadej Pogacar for the first time since last year's Tour de France. And so far in the Slovenian derby, it's 1-0 to Roglic. UAE team Emirates rode entirely for Pogacar throughout the race, despite having some quality cards to play. But when he attacked, he couldn't drop Roglic nor Richard Carapaz. It did look like Roglic was pulling some faces though, not sure if that was an act or if he really was in trouble, but either way, he was feeling pretty good at the finish. He launched his sprint in the closing couple of hundred metres and not even Bogatia had an answer. It was Roglic at his very best, meticulous, cool, measured, calculating, and finished off with his usual killer instinct. Pogaccio would have to settle for second, as he did in that same race last year behind Enric Mass, with Simon Yates taking the third step of the podium despite crashing earlier on in the race. In the women's race, Cecily Uttrup Ludwig took her second win three years after her first. Uh, she came to the line five seconds clear of Marta Cavalli, with Juliette Laboue a further 11 seconds back in third. Two days earlier, Davide Formolo took his first ever victory in a one day race outside the Italian National Championships. It came at the Coppa Agostoni, where he crossed the line just over half a minute clear of his teammate Mark Hirschi. Uh, that was UAE Team Emirates' 53rd victory of the year so far, but that still leaves them trailing Jumbo Visma by 10. Uh, back to Arno De Lee now, and it was the Femen Arden Classic that he won with a broken cleat yesterday, but he'd already powered his way to victory at the Circuit Franco-Belge earlier on in the week. Now looking at Strava, you can see why he's so good in these one-day races. He had a kick of over 1500 watts in that race and a very long sprint to the line. Those were his 18th and 19th career wins, 14 of those have come in one-day races. His strike rate really is quite incredible. He's just short of 100 days of racing as a pro rider now. So with 19 wins, that's a win every five days of racing, or there or thereabouts. Meanwhile, at the Tour of Vendée, Arno Demar took his first win in Arkea Samsic colours, but I think the day will be remembered as the final pro road race for Peter Sagan. He finished ninth, but it really feels like the end of an era, doesn't it? Uh, we'll do a show in the future to look back at what was an incredible career, as I'm not gonna be able to do it justice right here. In the meantime, a huge congratulations to Peter Sagan and a big thank you for everything he did to elevate the sport and bring it to a whole new audience. Right, just before I wrap up the rest of last week's racing, I'll get onto what we've got coming up for you on GCN Plus this week, shall I? And it's a busy one. Today we have the Coppa Benocchi. Wout van Aert is on the start line, as he will be for Trey Valley Varazzini tomorrow and Gran Piemonte on Thursday. Uh, Pugaccia and Roglic look like they'll be using Trey Valley Varazzini as their final preparation for Lombardia this coming Saturday. Uh, that is the fifth and final monument of the year, and the start list looks like it'll be one of the best of recent times. Coverage of that race starts bright and early on Saturday morning, uh, meaning that you'll be able to watch the 238 kilometers of racing in its entirety if you so wish. 9 a.m. BST, 10 a.m. CST is the start of our coverage on GCM Plus, and I'm very much looking forward to that one, I must admit. 
Outside of Italy, we've got a host of other one-day races this week. Tomorrow, it's the men's and women's Banche de Banche from Belgium, and also the Munsterland Giro from Germany. It's a sprinter's delight in Munsterland. We've got Coy, Philipsen, Grunewagen, Malir, Pedersen, Groves, Ewan, Laporte, and Christophe, amongst others. Whilst in Banche de Banche, Arnaud de Lee is on the start line, and that's probably all you need to know. I jest, of course, there are plenty of quality riders there who will be looking to prevent him taking yet another win. On Thursday, we have the Elfstedon race, where many of the aforementioned names from the Munsterland Giro will be competing. And then on Sunday, it's the 117th edition of Paris Tours. Uh, Dali, Laporte, Wellens, Groves and Demar are amongst those on the provisional start list for that one. Uh, that's the only race, in fact, this week with any territory restrictions, so please check if that's available where you are. On the same day as Paru Tour, we also have the first of eight stages that make up the Tour of Turkey, a race that was postponed from the spring due to those catastrophic earthquakes. Uh, it looks as though it might be there that Mark Cavendish makes his return to competition for the first time since crashing out of the Tour de France in July. Outside of road racing, we have the final round of the UCI Mountain Bike World Series from Mont saint anne in Canada. Short track, cross country and downhill all coming to a culmination there from Friday through to Sunday. And then we're also hoping to be able to bring you coverage of the second UCI World Gravel Championships from Italy over the weekend. Not quite confirmed yet, but I shall be keeping my fingers crossed for that one. What is confirmed is that we'll have the first top level European cyclocross race of the season on Sunday. That's the exact cyclocross from Beringen in Belgium. And Actually, I lied earlier because there are also territory restrictions on that one in that you can't watch it if you're in Belgium, but you can anywhere else on GCN+. And then beyond all of that, we've also got a brand new documentary coming out tomorrow. Uh, that is where we follow our very own Connor Dunn as he takes on the most brutal gravel race in the world, Unbound. 330 k's of unforgiving Kansas landscape, and he experienced a lot more mud than he was hoping for. Former and current World Tour pros Nathan Haas and Larry Warbass also feature in the documentary, as does up-and-coming gravel racer Anna Yamalki and 2022 Unbound champion Ivor Slick. Can you describe Unbound 2023 few sentences? The thing with Unbound is it's been on my bucket list for so long, I've been wanting to come here and race. Sports can favour the underdog, and that's what I'm clinging to. My sport crew is my dad. I'm excited about it. It's like I've got a job. Unbound is a totally different animal. Very few people can race the Tour de France. Unbound is the Tour de France of gravel, and anyone can race it. My experience of Unbound. No one told me I'd be running. Bedlam, mud, carnage. Muddy chaos. Someone asked me the question, if you were to do that 21 days of the rainy Giro again, or Unbound, starting tomorrow, which would you do? And I said I'd do the Giro. That was too hard, man. Back to last week's racing now, and as mentioned, it was Orluis Ola who won the Crow race for Kaka Rural. A defending champion, Matty Mohoric, was out of the running almost from the off after an untimely crash on the opening stage. Uh, that marked the first victory on the road for about a year for Elia Viviani of Ineos Grenadiers. Viviani had set up a second the following day, though, behind another rider from Kaka Rural, Yuri Lysio. Parasini took Q36.5 seventh victory of the year on stage three, but it was the rider second across the line, Tobias Lunt, who went into the leader's jersey. Mohoric did have something to celebrate one day later by winning stage four ahead of Magnus Sheffield, who also had something to celebrate as he'd gone into the leader's jersey, which changed hands again the following day as Olar took the win and the 10 bonus seconds with it. In finishing second behind Campbell Stewart on the final day, Alexander Kristoff came within three seconds of the Venezuelan on the GC, but would have to settle for second overall with Hayter third and Sheffield fourth. Over at the USCX, it was business as usual for Magali Rochette, who remains unbeaten in the six races there so far. Caroline Manny finished second on Saturday in Charm City, whilst on Sunday, fellow Canadian Sydney McGill got her best result on what's been a very consistent series for her so far. And talking of best results, there were two riders who took the biggest wins of their careers on the men's side. Anton Ferdinand has been knocking on the door every race there so far this year, and it was he who took the spoils on Saturday, whilst the man he beat that day, Andrew Stromayer, took a solo win at the end of a very tactical battle on Sunday. He'd been off the front at the start of the race, but it looked like he was paying the price of that midway through. 
It looked like there'd been some sort of collusion between him and Vincent Bastains, though, with neither appearing to be willing to help chase the other down if they were off the front. Either way, though, a brilliant win for Stromae in what is his local race. Uh, the USCX will take a little bit of a break now before the final round takes place in Falmouth at the end of this month. Uh, sticking with off-road, it was Roadies who took the titles at the European Gravel Championships in Belgium at the weekend, although strangely for Lorena Vibes, she didn't even cross the line first. That accolade went to Australian Tiffany Cromwell, who obviously isn't eligible to win a European title. Strange, but not unprecedented. The Australian National Road Championships has been open to all in years gone by. Anyway, Vibes took the title, getting the better of Fem van Empel in a sprint, as you would expect, whilst Jasper Sturven won the men's race with Tim Malia second, and Paul Voss flying the flag for the thoroughbred gravel races in third. Uh, Sturven said post-race that he hopes to compete at the World Championships on Sunday if Lidl Trek, his team, allowed him to skip parry tours. It's a whole new world out there right now. And if you'd like a wrap-up of what happened in Snowshoe for the latest round of the UCI Mountain Bike World Series, make sure you tune into the GMBN Racing News Show, which will be up today as well. Well, I shall finish this week's Racing News Show in the opposite way to how I started it as in with some confirmed transfers, signings and renewals, rather than the plethora of rumours that are going around at the moment. Uh, first up, Team DSM have extended the contracts of Pfeiffer Georgie, Francisca Koch and their sprinter Charlotte Cool. Group Armour FDJ have made a couple of new signings, Matt Walls, the British rider from Bora Hansgrohe, and Cyril Bart, the Frenchman from Burgos BH. Uh, Katrine Olerad will move from Mobistar to Uno X in 2024, whilst Ella Wiley heads to Jayco Live from Life Plus Wahoo. Harry Sweeney will leave Lotto Death Destiny after three years with that team. He signed a three-year deal with EF Education Easy Post, who have also signed 18-year-old Markel Bolocchi, son of Yosebo, who becomes the latest rider to go into the World Tour straight from the junior ranks. And finally, probably the biggest signing of the week was that of Tour de l'Avenir winner Isaac Del Toro. No surprise to see that he's been signed up by UE Team Emirates, but I was slightly surprised that it's only on a three-year contract. Normally they like to lock the youngsters in for a long time these days. I very much look forward to seeing how he gets on in the pro ranks though, and it's going to be great for Mexican fans to have someone to support again. And talking of Mexico, it will be there that Vittoria Busi will try to regain the world hour record in just over one week. Uh, she successfully raised enough money for the attempt via crowdfunding, so it's going to take place in Aguascalientes, where Campanart set his benchmark in 2019, on the 11th of October. The distance she has to beat is 49.254 kilometres, that of course being set by Ellen van Dyke, and we wish Vittoria the very best of luck with that. Uh, one last thing, Charlie Quarterman, who was racing for Coratec Sella Italia this year, has announced that he'll be retiring pro cycling at the end of the season, so we wish him all the best in everything that comes next. Right, that is all for this week. No doubt there'll be lots more news to bring you this time next week, so I hope to see you all then.